Sometimes I feel like a motherless child. Sometimes I feel like a motherless child. Sometimes I Like a motherless child A long ways from a home A long ways from home um, Start anywhere? Yeah, just anywhere. Just... Okay. Well, um... When I was 14, it was, um, I can't think of dates and things, it must have been just after the war, so it's 45, 46, and um, I'd come back from various um, places of evacuation. My father had found me somewhere to stay, because he was still in the Merchant Navy. Um, and then, I sort of found, I can't remember how I found out, but I found out he still knew where my mother was because I'd thought that they split up before the war and got together during the war and after the war they'd split up again, but I found out he knew where she was, what comments he made. So one day he gave me uh, an address um, and I went along to this old LCC um, block of flats, very scruffy quite near King George V docks, a really bleak estate with walkways, steps up and walkways. Um, I went along to this address, knocked on the door, and a very bedraggled woman wearing a, a dressing gown came to the door and her dark hair was sort of clipped up because I used to wear bangs at those times and she got her clips in to keep, you know, for her bangs for the evening. And uh, I recognised her from photographs as my mother. Um, she didn't recognise me at all and looked at me with that suspicion that a caller at your door who you don't recognise might elicit. And, uh, there were a few seconds when she looked at me, it was rather hostile, and, and I said, is your name Peggy Budgeon? And she looked even more worried at that. This stranger knew her name. And she may well have had a different name by then. Even more hostility. Um, and she went, yes, who are you? And I said, rather dramatically, I am your daughter. And there was a few seconds of change. And then she threw her head back and went, a particular sort of cockney intonation. Oh, Jean! Oh, Jean! And then to the people behind her in the flat, it's my daughter, it's my daughter's come home. None of this affected me at the time. I was only concerned with my own dramatic situation. Then she pulled me in and it was, you know, a really small municipal early form of council housing, a tiny little kitchen, but in the kitchen, which had a hallway beside it, there was a table set out with a body with a white sheet over it. And my mother introduced me to this cadaver. This is Harry. Now, Harry is my father's name, so a bit confused, but she found another Harry who had died on her. And I learnt a lot more about him when she herself was dying of cancer and I was nursing her at the weekends, I learned about this other Harry, who was the love of her life, so she told me. Um, but this was her, her lover. She was living with his family in this flat. I'd seen my mother before. I can remember I have about four or five memories of when I was a child, because my mother didn't leave for good till I was seven. Um, I can't remember much about that because I know 
my father and my mother kept splitting up and I was left with aunts and uncles and grandmothers and things. Just occasionally we'd sort of, there are memories which indicate that my mother and my father and I were living together in some place or other, usually an aunt's house. Or, so I had odd memories of her and an odd sense of who she was. Um, and like most children, I thought she was very beautiful. She had the thing I remember most and most clearly, and I don't think this is a, an overlay of memories, is she had coal black hair. But, you know, like Raven's Wing, it almost had other colours in it, iridescent black. Um, and huge cow-like eyes, and that I remember. Um, I also remember her to be very bad tempered, very angry, constantly in trouble with whoever we were living with at the time. And then my, the, the other memory of her is one of absence, you know, coming home to some aunt's place that we were staying in and then telling me my mother had gone, had left, and I was then to be parked with some other aunt on a more permanent basis. So from and then when I was evacuated, my father had obviously reconnected with her and just remember wartime, you know, feelings that must have been around, you know, people desperately trying to find some kind of love and permanence at a time when everything was going completely berserk and very dangerous. Um, I was evacuated to a place in Warwickshire and uh, my father brought this woman down who was my mother. And I can't tell the difference in my memory between her and Joan Crawford, because there was this incredibly handsome woman with the hair rolled up like this and black, beautifully tailored suit with costume jewellery and gloves and a handbag and high heel court shoes. And we were having a sort of evacuees, um, locals, school party, you know, with songs and uh, things and my mother, just this fantastic woman, got up and sang Baby Mind. Baby Mind, don't you cry, which was you know, a big film at the time. And then she disappeared again. And I didn't see her until I arrived at the block of flats saying, your name Piggy Budgeon. So it's rather like a series of torn photographs that you might try to put together to make a whole that I really only have fragments of things about her. My arrival on her doorstep meant that she got another hundred points towards rehousing and she got a prefab so I represented a prefab to her which we then went and lived in together for two years. Um, my father when I did that his resentment and anger was such that he was on a ship to New Zealand. When he got to New Zealand, he did what is called jump ship. He left the ship and settled in New Zealand. I didn't hear any more from him until I got a letter when I was 21. I was at university. And by that time, I'd left my mother. Um, and it's only recently that I've begun to think the only consistent thing, if you can call it consistency, from a merchant sailor was all through the war, whenever my father was, um, whenever he was on shore, he would come down to wherever I was evacuated. He would make sure to see me. Now this may only have been a handful of times, and I took that totally for granted. And it's only subsequent, I think, poor man, after the war he comes home. And he may have been a drinker and ne'er-do-well and all the rest of it, but he did have some sense of responsibility for me that my mother didn't have and I feel so sad now that you know he died in New Zealand or Australia and we never reconnected and what was he a young man of 23 when the war broke out and I look around at the young men I know now young working men with kids and the way that they the best of them struggle to have some relationship with a child and don't know how to do it. And my father must have been like that. And I feel so sad that that discontinued. 
and I lost him and gained my mother. When I look back now, because you know, you accept any kid accepts or any you accept where you are. You don't think it's unusual to be without parents or living with aunts or that kind of people who don't want you. But the kind of uh, inventory of what I had as a child is all negative. I I had no continuity, no continuity at all. I don't remember being until I was evacuated. I don't remember being in one place for any length of time. I don't remember being in one school. I don't remember having continuous friends, a continuity of friends. I don't remember having a continuity of family. Um, I don't remember a birthday party. I don't remember a bedtime story. I don't remember being held or cuddled or told that I was important or I, don't, I had none of that and I never sort of questioned that then or afterwards for a very long time it was just the life I had and it wasn't until I had kids of my own I realised there was something missing in me and I think it's a very obvious thing is that I don't really know and I hate the word because I don't know what it means anymore. I don't know how to love. It doesn't happen spontaneously or naturally with me. Um, mothering didn't come naturally to me. I did the best I could, but I did it intellectually. I, I thought, how do I have to behave? Uh, my life wasn't particularly good in terms of relationships up to then. I damaged a lot of people and um, disregarded their love for me. And I, I had love in bundles, at least of all from you um, and from other, other men in my life. And I think not knowing how to parent, not knowing how to be a mother, not knowing how to love, meant that I got the whole relationship of love and affection completely balls up. Because when I began to be, when I was a teenager and began to be hormonally aware and interested in, well, I was never interested in sex particularly, what I was interested in was approval. And what I muddled up was somewhere deep inside me I was looking for the love I hadn't had or the approval or the affection. And of course the moment that you, you can get it from men, I took whatever was on offer and took it for granted and didn't realise that love among adults is a whole different thing. It isn't a question of just supping it up like a sponge. It's a two-way process. And I think that's one of the fallouts of not being given parental love and parental approval, is that you then confuse the kind of approval that you get sexually or in adult relationships and kind of assume somewhere without putting it into words that it is the unconditional love that a parent gives a child. So you don't have to be grateful for it, you don't have to work on it, you don't have to treasure it, you don't have to revere it, you don't have to respect it. It's just tapping into a source of love. And I think I did that. I think to some extent I've done it all my life until Through my children, I became aware of the colossal mistake that that was, or the colossal mismanagement that was. I saw that failure in myself and that inability to give unconditional love, because that's what parents try to do, good parents, healthy parents. 
it set up problems in my girls, in my daughters. You know, that what I try to do intellectually doesn't quite make up for the spontaneous, easy love that a parent gives its child. I did the best I could. That I'm quite proud of. I worked things out and I tried to evolve the relationship with my girls. And I succeeded with the second one much more than with the first. Um, and it's funny, when I was pregnant with Kate, which happened quite late in my life, I was 39, having thought I couldn't have children, I didn't even think about whether or not I should have the child or whether I was competent enough to have the child or whether my relationship with Bill would sustain that. Um, it was just an offer you couldn't refuse. Um, but I remember a couple of months after I was pregnant, I was waking up early in the morning and I was absolutely overwhelmed with foreboding and depression. A, I knew the child I had was a girl, no question about that. B, that I would reproduce the relationship I had with my mother. It was the most terrible feeling of oppression in a way that I was fated to repeat the same unloving relationship I'd had with my mother, that my daughter would hate me. Although I didn't get mum and dad, and I had absolutely no, none of that, no uncles, no one who loved me for myself when I was a child. But what I did have were teachers. I went to school, only about the second generation of working class people who really did have full time education, and subsequently went to grammar school on a state scholarship. And I was quite bright, um, and I think needy, and I think we forget that most people are decent, and if they get a sense of need around them, they will do something about it. So I was attractive and I was needy, and by the time I got into grammar school, I had really solid, good, decent people who at that time particularly just after the war, and in a school, the grammar school, East Ham Grammar School for Girls, which had been founded by Oxford Blue Stockings, who were working in the East End to better the poor. They became my mentors, um, and gave me, so they couldn't give me affection, although, yes they did, but what they gave me was nourishment. And even when I was evacuated, before I went to East Ham Grammar School, the teachers whose names I can't even remember. I was a loner, I didn't have parents who came to see me. Um, I wasn't particularly well socialised. The teachers who came away with evacuees or the social workers, whatever they were at that time, they were good to me and cared for me and there was some continuity there. It wasn't the affection of families but it was a trust in human beings. I wouldn't have put it like that at the time, I didn't have that language, but subsequently I look back and I think you're a socialist for very good reasons, because socialists believe in the goodness of people. They're more religious than most other religions. They really do believe in the worth of human beings in the right situations. They do believe in the decency of people. They do believe in the creative intelligence of people to put things right. Um, and that's the kind of bedrock of my socialist beliefs. And it's through experience. It's not through only through intellect. I really did grow up trusting that if I flew out a, a hand in need, somebody would grab me. When I got to East Ham Grammar School, one of the teachers um, was... Um, sort of early feminist, I suppose. Um, and she invited me along to, first of all, 
talks about Soviet Russia at the the uh, YCL, um, and I can't remember very much of what I did there, but I can remember there was a kind of community of young people who were hopeful and, and, and strong and wanted to do things and it was just like being in a it was like being held and remember I hadn't been held and the feeling of being held by a group of people who talked not at you but to you and through you and with you um, and that was such a good feeling. Um, God. And also it had the very lovely Peter Debuse, who was my first boyfriend, who went to the grammar school for boys. Um, and we used to go off to um, potato picking camps, international camps, which later on I went to with you, Malcolm, when we were students and we used to go to the international fruit picking camps. That was precisely the same experience as when I was, you know, 12, 13. That feeling, and also it gave me an international feeling. I wasn't, I, I became aware of a, a world full of people like myself, young people, you know, who came from France and Spain and Germany and all over and who were much the same as myself. Okay, me as a performer. Um, obviously everyone gets a buzz out performing and being um, being applauded and people who are looking for love and approval very often become performers because it's an easy way in but it's a dangerous way in. Um, because audiences don't like being faced by someone who wants them to love them. Audiences want to be pleasured and it, it reverses the, the role between audience and performer. Um, anyway, apart from all that heady stuff, um, I had a good voice and I loved singing, always did. And um, not just because you're on the other side of the camera, but I think the things I enjoyed doing most of all were actually playing and singing with you. Because I liked the songs we sang, because they were unpretentious, you know, folk, you know, folk and blues and stuff, which came naturally to me, and we shared a pleasure in those, in that kind of music. Um, and I think that's what I loved best of all. But because I was pretty, because I could sing, um, I think quite a few people made me into something. It certainly happened with Richard Rodney Bennett, who heard my good voice. And uh, by that time I was connected with the uh, establishment club, and so therefore had a kind of a place in the world of entertainment. He introduced me to jazz which although I love jazz, it's not my metier, I don't, I don't have that musical ear. Um, music doesn't flow out of me, it's not a natural, you know, I've had enough students since then who are great musicians and great singers to know that they don't think about what they do, they don't want to be this, they don't want to be that, it just flows out of them. For me, again, intellectually, I became a jazz singer. I learned how to do, to give an impression of doing things. And I wasn't bad. I wasn't bad. But um, I didn't really enjoy it. I was terrified a lot of the time. It didn't give me pleasure, really. Whereas singing with, with you, just in our travels together or at parties and things, I loved that. I, I absolutely loved it. And it was easy and spontaneous. So we did some very nice things. And that's honestly it. I enjoyed some of the things I did with feminist theatre, which is what I did most of in the 70s, early 80s. Um, because it was a kind of teaching mode, rather, 
as well as a performing mind. Hot dress, birth giver, keeper of the keys, Aztec and Egyptian are new. Politics lets you off the hook, you know. You can, you can, you can claim on on the worthy scale what you can't claim on the artistic scale. Sometimes, although we did some very very good things, I really enjoyed working with Sadista Sisters and um, and Women's Theatre Group and various other and Belt and Braces. I really enjoyed those things. And again, it was that thing of being held. You were with a group of like-minded people. Don't tell me that you lost your nerve and indulged in something Anyway, I, I, I did quite well in um, in my bits and pieces of performance, um, but I was never the real thing, and I knew it. And so, when I broke up with Bill, who was very, very successful in his world, um, I knew I was going to be the parent for the two girls, whether I liked it or not. So I had to have a job that gave me school holidays and meant I was home in the evenings and had a regular income. 
and uh, so as luck would have it a job came up in, in uh, the development of a community theatre school which was to develop not actors but theatre makers which is actually what I'm interested in and it was in at the start to develop this course and uh, so I took the job. I used to travel an hour and a quarter to work and an hour and a quarter back and look after a house and look after the kids. Um, well, Bill was off finding himself somewhere, um, which he hasn't succeeded in doing to this present day. Um, but I enjoyed the work and now I have dozens of students who will throw their arms around me and say, we love you, Jean, and they keep in touch, and I'm important to them in their lives, and they turned out to be performers in a way that I never was. So, it's okay. It's all okay.